The last, uh, last uh, sentence of the first paragraph says, looking back, with the entirety of scripture at our disposal, and especially Paul's powerful explanation of the atoning death of Jesus, we know so much more about what Jesus was doing for us than the followers did at, his, at that time. I think it's true we should know more, and I think we have unpacked more, but what about those quotes I read earlier? Do you think those quotes represent a deeper knowledge of what Christ achieved? In fact, there's a lot of theories about the atonement out there. And we get accused of having a very narrow view because we teach a healing view. And, and those who, who, like other views, will say that the Bible has rich, rich metaphor and display of many, many different theories of atonement. And, and we like to teach all of those theories. Remember this. Metaphor is only metaphor as long as there's some cosmic reality to which it's directly linked in teaching. If there's no reality to which it's teaching, the metaphor is not metaphor, it's fantasy. Number one. Number two, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think actual healing, transfer, transformation, and renewal of your heart to be like Jesus in character is metaphor or is that reality? And so when they say that we're teaching metaphor, they're denying reality. They're obscuring what God is trying to do. But let's look at some of them very quickly. How about this one? God is offended... We read this earlier in one of the quotes. God's offended, and the only thing that would uh, take care of his personal offense, because sin is personally offensive to God, and he must be personally appeased. Remember this? We read that earlier. God is offended, and his honor must be satisfied. This is the satisfaction theory of atonement. This is level one of moral development. Level one moral development, satisfaction theory of atonement. There's another one. Satan had a legitimate claim to earth and the lives of humans, so Jesus makes a deal with Satan to exchange his life for the life of mankind. This is the ransom theory of atonement, level two moral development. God must punish sin in order to show his government doesn't play favorites. This is a governmental theory of atonement, level three thinking. Law, the law itself cannot be changed and, law, and every, every breach of the law requires that it must be punished. Sin must be punished so God had to inflict the punishment to keep and maintain the law. This is the penal substitutionary view of atonement. This is level four thinking. God loved us too much to let us go and Christ came as the means to win us back with love. This is the moral influence theory of atonement. This is level five. God built his universe to operate in harmony with his own nature of love, and there are certain protocols by which life exists. Deviations from them are, are destructive, and humankind is now out of harmony with God's design, terminal, dead in trespass and sin. Christ died to restore the human species back to harmony with God and his design. This is both the recapitulation theory and the Christus Victor theory of atonement. What's level six moral development? And level seven, not only understands we had to be one with love and God had to fix what was broken, but God had a broader and deeper purpose than just the salvation of humankind, that he was solidifying his entire universe. All things in heaven and earth are reconciled to Christ at the cross through what Christ was achieving. And understanding the larger purpose, level seven, the healing model of atonement. Amen. <clears throat> The first four levels, if you'll notice, are all false, and they're all based on ideas that incite fear. And all these ideas are based on those first four levels. Sin must be punished. God, in order to be just, must inflict pain, suffering, and death. God is the source of suffering and death. God killed Jesus at the cross. God is the one we need to be protected from. Sin isn't the problem. The problem is God, what God will do to you if you sin. Those are the first four levels. One other thought about this, and it's a sad observation. Normal and I went through this, the, the seven levels of moral decision-making just now, very quickly. We have a much longer and deeper explanation of that in our DVD uh, out there that from, from fear to friendship, growing the seven steps with God. But one of the realities of how the human being develops is that you can't skip levels. You can't go from level two to level six, from level four to level seven. You actually have to comprehend the level above you, assimilate it before you can go on to the next level. And in fact, most people cannot comprehend, truly understand in a thoughtful and meaningful way, one level beyond the level they're currently operating at. This, this, I had an epiphany this week when I realized that for the last six years, uh, those who hold to that level four way of thinking 
you'll see across the landscape, if you, were, if you guys are reading wide some of the critiques of what we teach here, you'll find that they consistently come back and say that I teach moral influence theory. Teach what? Moral, moral influence theory. That's level five, level five understanding of atonement. In that quote from the review, the quote from the review said this is one of the problems of the moral influence theory. They deny the substitutionary nature of Christ's death, namely that God had to kill the innocent in place of the guilty to satisfy justice. That was in the review. Because the person who wrote that is operating level four. When you're operating level four, law and order, you can only comprehend one level above you. And so they see everything that's not what they're teaching as moral influence theory. And they keep attacking moral influence theory. Because, and, and, here's, and here's the sad part of it. They don't see it as something to grow into. They see it as something flawed that denies an objective piece that needs to be there. And thus they reject the moral influence theory, which has closed them off to further advancement and development. They can't grow. They can't grow to six. They can't go to seven. They're stuck because they have denied an advanced knowledge of truth. They're not moving forward in the light. Yes. Tim, that's a great point. And the question I have is, do you have a resource or plan to create one um, that would take people through that step? Say, you know, that yes, my next book called The, the God-Shaped Heart. Because, you, because my, you, so many of you take you know, your stuff, you read it, and you're thinking, yes. why can't people see this? My next book, exactly. The God-Shaped Heart, The Transforming Power of Love which is already written, and we're going to sign a contract with the publisher this week. We'll be out in 2017 sometime, so next year. Um, but does that make sense to you? This is the same position Lucifer is in we read about. There was nothing more God could do for him because he rejected the truth. What does it say in Thessalonians? That the, the, the wicked are lost because they did not love the truth and thus be saved. When we come to a position where we close our mind to advancing light, advancing truth, then we can't continue to grow and heal. And until that, that changes, until they're willing to move forward and reevaluate. And what causes people to reevaluate a position they're currently locked into? The Bible says we rejoice and celebrate in our trials and tribulations because they build character. What does that mean? It means that we, life experiences will often put us in a position where our current level of understanding does not answer it. It doesn't fit. I, I, I paid my tithe. I, I kept every Sabbath. I ate only the right foods, and yet this bad thing has happened. How can this be? I pay my tithe and I'm going bankrupt. How can that be? It's not supposed to work this way. I check the box, I'm supposed to get more money. So those realities cause people to step back. There must be some other explanation to rethink and find a new understanding. Some instead go, well, it's ridiculous. I quit. I, I don't want anything to do with God. It was all farce. It doesn't work. That's what some do when those challenges come. We need to offer a better understanding of reality. And we have a better understanding, don't we? Yes, over here. So, give your explanation of how we determine what is truly truth. Yeah, I, I, we offer the integrative evidence-based approach. The approach that integrates scripture, science, and experience, showing that all three must come to the same conclusion when there's evidence available from all three. Some, some things there's not evidence of all three on, but, but, there, but there is for most things. Most of the major things we teach is evidence for all three if you understand how reality works. And so our scripture understanding has to be in harmony with testable laws like the law of love and how that actually works in reality. And if you have doctrines that have God violating his own design protocols, like I love you, all I want is your love. But if you don't love me, I'm forced to use power to inflict pain, suffering, and death upon you. That's actually a violation of the law of liberty. And if you violate the law of liberty, love is destroyed. Try it in any relationship. Try it on your spouse. Love me or I'm going to kill you. You immediately get that, oh, no, I couldn't work. Okay? Because it's actually out of harmony with construction, how it's designed. And so when you get a certain idea, we want to have, have it internally consistent throughout Scripture. But it also has to be harmonized with various ways God's nature and character actually operate in the real world. And Jesus used this method all the time. So he would teach from scripture, and we give examples in nature and real life experiences all the time, showing how they all connect it. Yes? It, it seems that everybody, especially if, if you've grown up in a church or if you've grown up with Christian education or religious education, you, you have been led to believe that you must be right, that somehow your thinking must be perfect. And so, in my mind, subconsciously, that, that leads to an arrogance that you, you may not overtly project on people, but it, there's an undercurrent of arrogance. And what I see in a lot of our leaders, if you will, 
is that somehow they are condescending to the idea that we may be, we may have a bigger point than what they right. we did. So scripture, man looks on the outward. outward appearance, God looks on the outward. heart. Performance is what? Outward. Rules are what? Outward. outward appearance. The heart is all about the one. Thus, Rahab lies. Her performance is to lie, to deceive, to bear a false witness. That's her performance. And a prostitute. And a prostitute. Where's her heart? Her heart is for God. My heart's on his side. I'm helping. I'm choosing him. Her heart is right with God. Her performance is not yet matured. She has a mature performance, but her heart is heading now in the right direction. This is the big difference. Okay? So let, let, me, let me move on to Monday's lesson because I think there's one more point I want to get to.